On today's More Than a Test, we have Dr. Doris Baker. We're really lucky to have this conversation because she goes head on on some of the conversations and questions we're all asking about science of reading and learners who read and speak Spanish. Uh, spoiler alert, she definitely talks about uh, the difference between phonemes and syllables and teaching in phonemes and syllables in Spanish. And it is a great conversation. I feel like she makes this so tangible for everyone. She also talks a lot about picture books and the books that we're exposing our children to. I will tell you as an educator, as a formerly bilingual, I, I taught bilingual kindergarten and as a mother, this conversation meant a lot to me and told me a lot of things that I can be doing for my kids and we can all be doing for all kids in our classrooms. Don't miss it. This one is with Dr. Doris Baker. Dr. Baker, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I, we were talking before the show um, that I haven't seen you in about a year, but about a year ago, you were working with Amira, the company I work for, on creating a parent report in Spanish um, because we had one that was live in English, but we had so many students using it in Spanish that we needed to create one for, for Spanish. And um, you, you gave us a lot of really great insights because all, all of your research, or a lot, not all of it, a lot of your research is around multilingual learners and kids who learn in English and, and speak Spanish at home or learn in both languages, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm very excited, by the way, that you have a report for parents because I, one of my favorite things to do is actually also work with Latino parents and kind of uh, support them in having questions and un answering questions that they have about anything connected to their kids um, attending bilingual programs or using Spanish at home and English at school. So um, I'm glad. That's so interesting. When I was talking to Claude Brizard, he told us that parents are often the missing leg on the stool of like helping kids grow in, in, in um, their academics. And what I'm hearing you say is that especially parents who speak Spanish and maybe don't speak English, they also struggle to find that resources. It's not just that the school can't get them, but they also can't get to the school. Is that your experience? Yes. Yeah, for sure. Exactly. Yeah. Finding resources is very hard. I remember when I was doing a project with, uh, with families in Dallas and uh, uh, we, they, we would get together at the library, at public library, at one of the public libraries. And the only book that we found there was a Dr. Seuss book about Christmas. And that was the only Spanish book that they had there. So it was a little bit like, oh, well, you know, if we really want to help uh, parents, we need to have more books for children in, in libraries too. Uh, this kind of Wow. You know, How long so, ago was that? Uh, that was uh, a, a few years ago, at least eight or 10 years ago. And it could be that the, maybe the, the new books were not coming out or so, but at least it just so happened that the day we were there. Um, you know, it's interesting we've ended books. up on this road because part of what you and I were talking about before is there, you know, so we're talking right now about how parents have a hard time finding the books, the resources for kids in Spanish. But additionally, teachers have this huge gap, right? Where whether they are a teacher who is monolingual and only speak English, but their students speak Spanish, or even if they are bilingual, the resources that are offered to them are often not matched English and Spanish. They have like half the resources in Spanish that they do in English. And so when you think about these teachers who are often working with multilingual learners, if you could give them like one message, and I know you have amazing research, but like one thing that you would tell them, what would, what would you say? Yeah, well, you know, like, I know that one message is always short, but, but this one reminds me of interactive reading, you know, like parents are dying to do things with their kids. And one of the things that they can do is interactive reading, you know, where they basically, you know, they try the kid to talk more than they do and they read a book. So asking WH questions, you know, like where is the character? What is it going to do? What do you think will happen? And, uh, and, uh, and just that interaction and language development really helps children um, get ready for, for preschool and kindergarten. We, I have a couple of studies on that. But, uh, but how to choose books is really tricky, too. And so, um, for example, for this type of book sharing, what you want are, are books that don't have a lot of words, but more kind of interesting pictures that the kids can engage in and the parents can uh, engage in the conversation with their children. And, uh, and sometimes that's hard to find, particularly in Spanish. And so uh, sometimes uh, what I found is many of the books are you know, either translation, which is not bad, but or they are um, books that have a lot of wording. And so it's hard, for example, for a parent with a young ch child to, to engage in a shared book reading when, when the book has so many words and they don't know what to do with that. Well, should I read what it says here or should I kind of just talk about the picture? No. Okay, so I want to go a little deeper on this because you might be making me feel a little bit better as a parent, first of all. But you have great research on the importance of picking you know, specific and quality 
picture books for children. Um, and when you're reading with children and I was, I was noticing, so we, my house has tons of children's books from like generations in my family and also the newer ones. And I was feeling bad the other day because my kids spend a lot of time in like Mo Willems, which has very, it is very picture driven. And I was reading, I think it was Blueberries for Sal, which is a very old picture book that is like all work. <laughs> I mean, it is a text rich and heavy book. But what you're telling me is that the fact that my child chooses picking an elephant every week might be okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Particularly if you can engage with them in the in the conversation about what that means and where to go. Yeah, it it really helps. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what other, so go ahead. I was going to say, what other recommendations do you have around children's books? This is really helpful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think that there are a couple of um, ideas. No one, for example, if we're talking about Latino like, population, Hispanic population, well, it's great to have books that reflect their own backgrounds. You no, know? so um, you know there are many mm -hmm. books that we can find on. Uh, uh, you know, festivities or on um, or on parents and families, you no, know, like extended families and things like that, nature, you no. Know? But then there are also the other books that I think are, are also important. And sometimes it can be either a translation if the parent doesn't speak English, or um, uh, or it can be in English. But uh, books that they know that the kids are going to see at, uh, in kindergarten or in the classroom, because what we're doing is giving them a little bit of a pre let's say a pre-teach or a pre uh, kind of like reading that will help them then participate in the, in the classroom, you know? And so I, I remember still vividly one of the studies that we had, um, we, we, um, we were, you know, I kind of trained the parents to how to, to work with their kids in, um, in doing read alouds at home with uh, book sharing. And then uh, I went to the school to see, and the teacher was using the same book that the kids had read in, 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 um, at home. And the teacher mispronounced the author's name, and the, the kid, you know, a three-year-old, was correcting. It's like, oh no, it's not actually David Pearson or whatever the teacher said, but it's, it's David Pearson. Pearson. So I knew that <laughs> this ch child had actually read the book and interacted with the book uh, with the pair with the parents, you no, know, um, compared to. That's the, great. Uh, that idea of like being able to let them be the expert in their kindergarten classroom by just giving them a little bit yeah. of exposure at home. It's not that they need to have it memorized, but just having that opportunity to read with books, creating that opportunity to feel comfortable and safe and confident yes. when a book is brought to your class. I, I could see how that would make a huge difference for readers. Um, yes. And and then the cultural competencies of just being able to like say, have yourself reflected in the books, I think, I think is, is really beautiful. Let me tell you something I heard from Anita Archer. I was at the Reading League conference um, like two weeks ago. Uh -huh. And she said that in elementary school, 50% of the books kids are exposed to should be nonfiction. They should be uh -huh. informational, informational stories. And I'm going to tell you that is not the case in my house. <laughs> my house is, we, we are rich in like, you know, joyful animal characters yeah. that are flying and dancing. So what did you, what do you think about that? Is it true that we should be putting 50% of the books that kids are exposed to are, are nonfiction? Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a really uh, good question. And actually something, we have a study that we did where with read alouds where we used both, no? And, and to me, I think that uh, both are important and are necessary so that kids get, get used to also seeing books where they're find, they're, they can actually find information. And uh, in the study that we had, it was exciting because it was with first graders. And so they wanted to know, for example, like uh, if turtles have teeth, right? And so you just go to the information book and you can find out, yes, does it say that or not? And when we find it, we can show the kid, oh, you know, it says here that, yeah, tur turtles don't have te teeth. So um, so the child can kind of learn like the difference between one book and the other. And, and that is kind of like a bit of a, a way of like, developing their literacy background knowledge, you know, of how books have different topics and have different purposes. And you read a book, an information book different than a fiction book. So I think that those kind of conversations are, are good and important for even kindergartners and they learn to recognize the books. I mean, that was one of our <laughs> actually goals with this Read Aloud project. Uh, but the other thing that I think that I was fascinated in particular connected to the project is that, uh, you know, the information text can help kids understand fiction. So in this case, for example, of, of turtles, we had an information book that talked about reptiles and turtles. And then we had the book that was fiction about um, a turtle having a toothache. And so it's Alex's impossible toothache. And so, of course, when Alex was complaining about impossible toothache and nobody believed him, you know, the parents didn't believe him. And the only person that 
believed, uh, believed him was the grandmother. And so there was this whole story about, you know, having a toothache and is it really a toothache or maybe it was something else that ended up actually was aching, not the tooth. But, uh, but when we told the kids that it's impossible for Alex to have a toothache because turtles don't have teeth, which is a fact, they got fascinated. I mean, they were, they totally understood the story, you know, while in the beginning, when you read just a fiction book, you just don't know, you know, why aren't the parents paying attention? I mean, we all have teeth, you know, it hurts. <laughs> and this is first graders, right? Like first graders kind of usually have one tooth, you know, that is uh, loose or they have lost a tooth. And so right. it, it was, but without that information text, it would have been really hard to, to really understand, you know, at the kind of the, the story at the deeper level. So the combination for me is what uh, works the best, yeah. It's so true. It's, I, I don't, you don't think about it often, but there's a lot of nuance to children's books, even the fictional ones, and that they, the nuance only makes sense if you understand the larger picture, right? Yes. Um, it, I, yes. I just had this experience with my own children and that, again, I, Mo Willem is getting a lot of play in this podcast, but uh, he is one where a pig wants to fly. And my mother, my, grand, my kid's grandmother, my mother was explaining to my daughter that like when pigs fly is this important statement that people make and what does this mean and where does it come from? And like now my daughter like runs around talking about when pig, pigs fly, she's three years old, but like the connection yes. is so much deeper. The book she likes so much more and she has this like whole new understanding, which I think is a lot of what people are talking about in the science of reading world right now is that this importance and this value of background knowledge, right? Yes, exactly. And that's what information text can give you. You know, like it's accurate, it's factual. And then you can build on that for, you know, all the stories, like you're saying, and all different kinds of stories. You know? But if they have like a fact that, that kids can kind of like, uh, you know, anchor on uh, their knowledge, then it will be much more fun for them to understand. Everything is just so much more rich. Okay. We're talking yeah. a lot about pre-readers, which is great for me because yes. my twins are three, <laughs> but um, you, your work spans. I mean, you have yeah. been a college professor in Spanish. And so one of the things that um, my team was talking about this week is that you published a book about teaching phonics in Spanish, right? Mm -hmm. and um, tell, tell me a little bit more. Yes. Uh, let me see exactly. Was it? Uh, yeah. Well, I, I thought, um, I mean, I, I published a book that, that has like the connection between um, content and language for second language uh -huh. learners. So, so uh, you know, second language acquisition methods, perspectives and challenges, I think it's that. Um, but I don't, um, yeah, tell me more about the decoding. I, I, I have That's published like... books. I have made actually also. <laughs> well, well, and you know what? We'll go straight to the question that our team has and gets asked all the time. And we've asked a couple of times on this show. There's two questions we hear all of the time. The first is, that in kindergarten and first grade classrooms that are teaching literacy in Spanish, that Spanish is taught in syllables, not phonemes. And, and, and so, I, and I think that we hear a lot of different things on this, on this conversation. I'd love to know what your perspective is. Yes, sure, sure. Yes, exactly. I would love to, because it is one of the most probably asked questions that people right. have for me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, actually we need both. No, I mean, w one of the issues with Spanish is that the syllabic uh, patterns in Spanish are very consistent and very simple. And so even, you know, a three-year-old, <laughs> going back to three-year-olds, could potentially syllabicate words like that, simple words like CD, CD words, no? And so, so it is not something that is acquired. In English, it's a little bit more complicated and sometimes it's one way, you know, other times it's another way. So it, it's a little bit more complex, no? But because of that um, kind of, let's say, consistency and simplicity, we think that we can teach kids to read uh, with syllables in Spanish. And actually what we have found is that kids also need their phonemes. So um, so kind of getting deeper into the what what are the sounds, the letter sounds within a syllable, no? Uh, one of the issues that we, we want to choose syllables is because sometimes the words in, in Spanish start becoming multi-syllabic uh, very fast. But the middle very, of and there's grade, significantly more multi-syllabic words. Yes, exactly, exactly. And so we think like, oh, that makes it easier because yeah, you don't want to have children, you know, give you the letter sounds of every single word in, in a word like astronauta, you know, because it takes forever. And by the time they finish, they probably won't remember <laughs> first part is it's too long and complicated. But Can you just imagine can, like the 15, the 14 letters yeah. and the part, yeah, I, know, I get what exactly. you're saying. Yeah, yeah. But what you can do is you can break it into syllables then. So for example, in astronauta, you know, you have the first syllable is as, A-S, and so you can do the syllable, you can do the sounds first in the syllable, not so as, 
and then combine it as no, and then you can go through all the top components. And what that does is that it really helps children get deeper into the decoding and really understanding that words have like sometimes letters that, in other words, that a syllable is not um, is not represented by one sound because that's what kids learn in the beginning. You know that oh yeah, ma for example, they would represent it as with an M. Yeah. Well, many studies have shown that, and so and the reason is because they think that ma is like one unit, and we just represent it with an M, and it's not true. So um, starting and teaching all the phonemes helps them understand that okay, every letter has a sound. Sometimes some letters have more than one sound, and that. Um, will ensure that they can read any word, you know? So word automaticity is really based on knowing the phonemes, you know, the letter sound correspondences, and also the syllables just to help, you know, get the words uh, read faster. I want to play back what I think I heard you just say so clearly, because I think it, it's about as clear as I've ever heard it. So it's lovely to hear it said so well. Um, is that, okay, so when we are, if we focus too hard on syllables first, so like we often see, we learn ma, me, me, my, mo, mu, or whatever, you know, what what can happen to children is that they don't actually see the the two sounds as separate. They see them as one. Yes. And so really they might only be seeing the first sound as the team. And that's mm -hmm. why it's so important that even though it's important to teach syllables and to break words into syllables, particularly these super long multisyllabic words in Spanish, knowing those phonemes is an imperative part of being able to read in both English and in Spanish. Yes. Exactly, exactly. Like for example, the word mariposa, which is butterfly, that butterfly. has a very you know, syllabic pattern, C, B, C, B, C, B. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, if you ask kids to learn it and they only have learned syllables, they would they would write M, P, S, A. And that would be mariposa for them. And so the reason is because, because uh, not because they can't, you know, like see their words, it's just they don't hear it and they think that the syllable is the unit, no? Just like you're saying, yeah. Wow, that's so interesting. That again, thank you. I feel like we have this conversation all of the time, um, and and it's so nice to have someone just say it so clearly. That um, and I don't know if you speak other languages, but in Arabic, sometimes you do assume the vowels. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. It, it's like it's a concept that makes a lot of sense to me because I do speak Arabic, um, and I've seen this where like the words are a little confusing because they assume vowels sometimes. Oh um, yeah. So interesting. Okay, so then the other question we get asked a lot, Adamira, is. Um, is the bilingual brain different than a monolingual brain? And so like when we're thinking about science of reading is like, is, is the way they learn different is what we're seeing in the brain different. Do you know much about that? Yeah. Yeah. I know a little bit because I, I've been reading or I've read quite a bit about by, um, of the papers by Bialystok, who is the, perhaps the researcher that has done the most research on the bilingual brain and comparing it to the monolingual brain. And, uh, and what we have found, well, what she has found is that, uh, the bilingual brain, yeah, you get activated different zones, different areas of your brain get activated and are much stronger. And so, but what we know is that that is good, no, because it, the brain is like a muscle. So the more you activate it, the better, you know, kind of the connections are. So, um, so that is important. But uh, I think that there is a language, uh, a language field that is there, and it's independent of the language and. Uh, and what Bialystok has found, for example, with, um, with their studies is that when you, as a bilingual person, when you start talking, like both languages get always activated at the same time. And what we do is, as uh, you know, as the person that is talking or um, answering or understanding is we, as, um, we kind of learn to suppress, you know, the bilinguals learn to suppress one language. So for example, now I know I'm speaking English, so I'm suppressing my Spanish. But if I were talking to somebody else in Spanish, by now, then English will be suppressed. No, so it's. I mean, we learn how to, um, you know, the, how to choose so, the words, that the the language that we, we have. So kids who are, you know, speaking Spanish at home and only learning in English at school, are their brains are already suppressing a language for the context they're in. Yes, exactly, exactly. And so one of the issues, and that's very important that you mention it. That and I'm concerned sometimes, and uh, with teachers particularly, is because they don't they don't make that uh, the difference, and so sometimes we have to make the connection for kids. Like for example, you know, like if we want to learn, if we're learning letter sounds, so all the consonants in Spanish and in English, almost all of them have the same sound. So we want them to connect that information uh, explicitly, you no, know, because they might not understand it, even though you might give them a, a word with. The same letters, no, like mano and hand or something like that, and they might not see that the n is the same 
in both languages. No, they still are seeing it like, you know. So just like we say we should be explicitly teaching phonics, explicitly teaching letter sounds, we should also be explicitly teaching children who are who are bilingual or multilingual that these two sounds that you're seeing in these two words are the same thing. Yes, exactly. hand and mono is is a perfect example because the n is in the same place even. Yes, exactly, um, exactly. And, yes, and yeah. so this is there's another level here of explicit like instruction, which is something that we're all talking about with science of reading is that one explicitly teach letter sounds phonics right in both languages. Phonemes are important in both languages, but also connecting the two different languages yes, is really important. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Because I mean, you don't want to you know teach them. I mean, if you were to teach them the, both the alphabets you know, the two alphabets, I mean, it, it takes a long time, no? And we know that, you know, that's not what the time that we have in school. So the more we can kind of maximize that connection, then the easier it will be for the children and also for the teacher to be able to- It's interesting because, it. so in my role, I spend a lot of time in schools. I get to spend a lot of time with teachers, help watching them use the product and things. And what I've noticed is that there are about a thousand models out there of teaching kids in two languages, right? So we've got kids who are going in English on Mondays and Wednesdays and Spanish on Tuesdays and Thursdays. We have the half day split. We have the, 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 you know, like two languages at once kind of thing. Um, we have some kids who are just basically learning in English all day, um, or the like descending where like they start at hundred percent in Spanish and then they move to 50%, 50%. When you think about this importance of connections, is there a, a better model for teaching kids who are multilingual? Is, is there a way that we should like be striving for? That's a really good uh, good question. Um, you know, I don't think we have found like really the, the perfect way. There is always mixed uh, feelings and mixed pros and cons. What, what seems to be more popular nowadays is the dual language model where kids are in, uh, you know, English speaking kids are, are put together with Spanish speaking native speakers and then uh, and then they they have Spanish and, and English uh, every day you know yeah. seems to be like a, the model that is preferred nowadays I think that uh, I like it in the sense that there is consistency so the kids don't have to think like oh Tuesday okay this is Spanish and then Wednesday in particular not just the, just the kids but also the teacher no because uh, right. uh, kind of trying to keep track of which day is what because everybody's speaking on a you know, a combination of both, then it becomes very difficult. So maybe more structured is better um, in that sense. And then, uh, but then the other thing is that independently of the of the model is to really have one, um, you know, a teacher that understands really both languages and how those both languages connect and how you can connect them, but also disentangle them and work on them different separately. Um, but also understand that, that cross-linguistic transfer, because this is what sometimes we um, consider. I mean, that's why we have bilingual programs, right? Because we think like, oh, everything that the kids learn in Spanish then can be transferred to English. And uh, right. the reality is that um, even though it's the same alphabet, there are differences you know, in terms of the number of phonemes, the number of regular, regular, I mean, regular words, the number of uh, the pronunciation of vowels. You know? So it is not everything transfers, and that's where the teacher you know, has to be a little bit more, so more cognizant of that and, and making sure that uh, what doesn't transfer gets really taught in English most of the time because that's kind of where the complexities are, are more there. And right. But what does transfer, then maximize it like we were talking about. You know, with, uh, really those okay. Connections. I want to ask one more question about this and then I want to talk about the bilingual factor and then we have to move on to talking about you. Goodness gracious, we have so many things to cover. But, you know, you said it was super important to, um, like, point out and explicitly teach the connections. What about the places where English and Spanish are, are really different? Is it also important, do you know, to explicitly teach the differences when two letters look the same but make different sounds in the two languages? What, what do you think about that? Yes, I think so. I think it's really important to also uh, to also show the differences in, in the languages so that the, the kids know that it's not the same, you know, and, uh, and they really kind of make a conscious. Uh, that's why, you know, you will spend, let's say, maybe a little bit more time on some um, you know, letter sound combinations in English because they don't exist in Spanish. And uh, so I think that, that that really helps them understand also what we're doing and why we're doing it that way. You know, I think that kids appreciate that too, that understanding of what exactly they are doing, you know, and becoming more conscious of their own uh, learning too. I think that what you're getting to, I, I feel like I'm going to bring Anita Archer one more time. Mo Willems and Anita Archer are just going to get pulled in here all the time today. But one of the other things, she ends her her presentation by saying, uh, don't hope, don't pray, teach. 
And I think that it's the kind of the same message here of we have yeah. to stop like hoping that things are going to transfer over from Spanish, but instead explicitly giving them the information where things there are connections to be made, that it's explicitly teaching them and not and not hoping and praying that they transfer over. I think that that's a good message for our listeners. Okay. Yeah. Um, we, I, talk, I promise we talk about the bilingual factor. So tell me a little bit about your research around the bilingual factor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so this is kind of very recent um, research. I've talked to other researchers that have, are also intrigued by that. But, uh, but what we are finding is that because what we want to know, understand, right, is the connection, like how the Spanish, particularly the natives, um, native Spanish native speakers, connect to English. You know, how can we help them with their English by knowing how how much uh, um, Spanish uh, knowledge, you no, know, whether it's language or whether it's reading really affects that you no know, and predicts English outcomes. You no. Know? I mean we, we also want to do it in the same language as well as across languages. But and so in this study that um, we, we I talked about briefly before is uh, we had so we had oral reading fluency in those uh, texts and we had reading comprehension and then we kind of uh, did an analysis of the predict predictive validity of uh, both on Spanish reading comprehension and English reading comprehension. And in addition to, to ORF, to early fluency and reading comprehension, we also had a, a language measure that is a bilingual be, uh, language measure, the VBAT, Bilingual Verbal Ability Test. And so okay. in, in, in this test, when students don't know the word in Spanish, let's say in English, we, we start with English, then they can say it in Spanish. So you're really kind of taking into account both languages. And when we do that, when we, we have that measure that kind of captures what student knows in both languages, then we find this um, kind of additional um, uh, factor that is that is uh, contributing to reading comprehension in English or in Spanish, in addition to oral reading fluency, you know, that we know has always been very closely connected to, um, to reading comprehension. Okay. So, let me say it again what I'm understanding, and then you can help me kind of drill it down. So yeah. we've always known, and, and this research confirms that, Oral reading fluency, the rate, like words correct per minute, for example, um, is a good indicator, predictor of a student's comprehension. Yeah. However, what I'm hearing is that if we add this extra layer of kind of letting students use their home language, ev even when they're reading in English, to, to, use, to like kind of make understanding, there's, there's another layer of comprehension, like this is also an indicator of, of their possibility of understanding. Is that, is that what you're telling me? Yeah, well, it's it's more that that if you take into account their language, kind of independently yes. of reading, but just their language in general, you know, how like much how like they, vocabulary then, yeah. and like the words. They, okay, great. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. We really connected to vocabulary, so in this measure had uh, you know analogies and uh, anything connected to language specifically, not necessarily reading. That yeah. also is a factor that influences uh, English reading comprehension and also Spanish reading comprehension. So for so example, you, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. So for example, in this study, we saw that uh, oral reading fluency, you know, in Spanish affects oral reading fluency in English as well as reading comprehension in English. So there is a there is a factor there, you know, that we know that you know, there is kind of cross linguistic transfer or transfer from skills from one language to the other. But what we um, were surprised to find is that English oral reading fluency does not affect reading comprehension in Spanish. So it only goes from the native language to English. But the fact Okay, so that, a child who yeah. reads faster in Spanish will also have better, comp like obviously it's not perfect, but you know what, what you saw yeah, was there, there's, there's, a, there's a, connection a correlation there, yeah. Yeah. to having better comprehension in English. Yeah. But if another child read faster in English, it doesn't necessarily, it won't impact, like you won't see that correlation to their, their comprehension in Spanish. Yes, exactly. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. And, and then these for, are all uh, Latino bilingual students, no? So, yes. so they all speak Spanish, Spanish and English. English. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So interesting. Yeah. I would not have guessed that to be true. So that's really interesting um, and, and surprising on so many in so many ways. But what I am hearing, though, is that also um, the word, word knowledge and vocabulary knowledge in Spanish, how, even if it's not like as large as it is, like is, if it, English isn't necessarily large or whatever, having this larger vocabulary in Spanish also impacts your English comprehension. Is that, is that what you're telling me? It, it's, it's kind Real of like vocabulary knowledge in both languages. So both that, languages. because okay. yeah, the assessment is kind of for both languages. So okay. it's in both. Yeah. And it's independent or of the influency. So for example, for Spanish, we have Spanish reading comprehension as the outcome, 
then the only effect is from Spanish or really fluency. Like English is not affecting it. It's but the language proficiency factor affects both reading comprehension in Spanish and reading comprehension in English. Yeah. Gosh, yeah. I know you had to break that down for me, but that is super interesting. And it, and it has, it has me thinking so much. I, I taught bilingual kindergarten at one point and like, I'm like picturing all of my students at this point from like 20 years ago, like, oh, that makes so much sense when I think about this child's like vocabulary and the words they were using. Um, that's so interesting and such important research and so useful for teachers yeah. who are, are working with multilingual learners. And what we know, I mean, I, across the country, we're seeing this, that um, our population of Spanish speakers continues to grow. I was on uh, with the superintendent of Washoe uh, School District in Nevada recently, and they're going to have more Spanish speakers and English speakers in the next couple of years. They will they will be there. Um, yeah. But un unfortunately, as a country, we're still woefully unprepared to fill those classrooms with Spanish oh, speakers. Yeah. Yeah, and so yeah. all of this information that people can kind of take and whether or not you speak Spanish and understand your students better is so valuable. Oh yeah, for sure. Yes, yeah, yeah. Just, just an anecdote. I just want to give you a brief anecdote, with, uh, you know, connected of to course. that uh, to the study they were doing. Uh, so, so uh, my husband and I would love to play Scrabble, and since we, you know, like we're young and uh, kind of recently married, we would always play Scrabble and uh, play Scrabble. And my uh, my husband would always win because we would do it in Scrabble in Span in English, you know. But then um, he's an, an English native speaker. But then recently we decided, okay, I can use any language that I know. Well, okay, I, I can only <laughs> use Spanish and English and you, if my husband uses English for the travel. And I would win the whole time. Like I won every single time. And, then, and really for me, it was like, oh, wow, I can't, I can't believe that. <laughs> and the reason is because you combine the languages. And so there, you know, it is, it is important to, to consider that kind of, you know, bilingual factors. I say that it's hard to still know how are we going to teach it? I know that nowadays, you know, we, we have more translanguaging activities and uh, in the schools, but uh, but I think we're still not exactly sure, no, how that can be kind of put into the connection, make that connection, no? But it exists. I mean, I think that what it's showing is that there is something there. Yeah. Um, I love the Scrabble metaphor. I think I'm going to use that because I, so often what we hear from like different organizations is what they're trying to promote is that Spanish is, is, a positive, right? Like it's not something that schools need to like be upset that kids are speaking Spanish. And said this, this yeah. is this huge thing that that children bring to the classroom that needs yes. to be brought to the classroom. And I think your Scrabble analogy is perfect is all of these kids who maybe don't sp barely speak English at all still should have the potential to one, read, but also win at Scrabble <laughs> and exactly. everything else in life, exactly. right? It's Scrabble, but it's life, right? That if we, if oh, we yes. <laughs> see them for what they yeah. have to offer and, and bring that language to the table, they, they, they have so many things that they can bring to all of us and to their own yes. lives. So I'm, I'm going to steal that. People are going to be hearing it. I really love it. Um, and I'm glad that you took us to a little bit personal because I would like to talk to you a little bit about your personal life because yeah. um, like I said at the very, very beginning, we started talking about, you know, my three-year old children, but you also have taught college level Spanish classes, um, in, in Oregon. So how, how did this happen? Like when you, when you were going to get your PhD, is this, did you think it was going to be always bilingual learners or, or what was really your interest and passion? Yeah, 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 yeah. Very good question. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, my husband and I, we got married in Mexico and then, um, in the States. And so, uh, he decided to do a PhD at the University of Oregon. So we moved there. And then while uh, he was doing his PhD, I was asked to, uh, to teach uh, Spanish at the college level. And, and I stayed there for uh, 14 years. So I taught, you know, all levels of Spanish and, uh, you know, from the advanced to the beginners. And uh, oh, we also started some community um, activities. So, um, for example, I had a third grade kind of like language or a language course. And one of the things that happened in Oregon, as many other states, is that suddenly the, the Latino population grew very fast, you know, like it, uh, and, uh, and really a lot of teachers did not know what to do with their students. And so what I thought my students could do uh, who were learning Spanish was to go and help support the teachers or any other organization that where they have a large number of Latino, Latinos to see, to, you know, to help them in any way they, they could. And of course, my students would come back and then tell me, the teachers don't know what to do. And, and it's not because they were not prepared. It's just that they were not prepared to have bilingual students in the classroom. No? Sometimes right. the students would sit just in the back. Some of them just wanted, you know, just kind of help me write the reference letter so that I can get a job. I mean, there was all this different kind of um, uh, information that I was getting from my students about um, about Latino students in, uh, in Oregon. And then uh, we also did another activity, which was, 
having uh, middle schoolers come to, school, to the university and my students, their job was to show them the university in Spanish, you know, kind of explain to them where things were. And, and that was also like an incredible success. You know, the principal would bring the kids, the middle schoolers to our class at the university and, uh, you know, we would kind of walk with them. And then I had some um, uh, heritage speakers in my class. And so the kids loved to see somebody like them, you know, that was yeah. so in college studying architecture and loving it and showing them all the things. So, uh, so that was really one of the reasons that led me to think about, oh, I, you know, I should really kind of get dig deeper into this and find out more. What is it that we can sub- do to support uh, English learners? Yeah. I just want to point out just like how forward thinking you were on that, because there are two things that I heard. Like, first of all, like middle school students getting to be on a university campus, seeing kids either learning their language or or seeing students that looked like them um, yeah. on a university campus, that reflection and how important that was. But then also, you know, sending your your Spanish students out into the classroom to see the reality for teachers, not in a judgmental way, but in a, you know, like what a yeah. what a big undertaking it is for teachers who are not trained for this to support these students and to try to offer. And I, I just, I can't even imagine, like, we all get so bogged down in our day to day, but to have that like mindset of like, we could do more with this. I'm not just teaching yeah. Spanish. There's more to learn here about culture, about people, about identity, about everything. I just, I think that's really neat. And so yeah. from that op- experience and those things that you created in Oregon, what happened next? Yeah, yeah. So, so then it just so happened that, you know, the whole, there was the whole movement of uh, reading first, of, you know, like kind of getting into classrooms and what uh, the Oregon district school district would tell us is like, yeah, we can, we can do the science of teaching reading and we can do, um, you know, no child left behind, but you have to teach in bilingu- bilingually. You have to help also our, our Spanish speaking teachers and our bilingual students to improve their skills in both languages, you know, which I thought it was very appropriate and, uh, you know, I mean, really kind of like <laughs> recognizing that it's an asset, Spanish is an asset or the native right. speaking other native language, you no? Know? And uh, so I got involved in that. And so I would provide, uh, you know, professional development for teachers and go into the schools and collect data. And, and I really, I learned a lot about how schools were run, what the kind of struggles were, what, 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 what the successes were too, you know? And that, that was kind of the fun part. Too, of seeing how some schools were so committed to their students that uh, we got pretty good results in, uh, in several um, classrooms. And that, and that was what you know, inspired me to continue. <laughs> and and still <laughs> to this day, you do professional learning for teachers. We were talking that, like right, even now you're doing that, yes? yes. Oh, yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah, just, just today in the morning, I had, um, I gave a webinar to, <laughs> to teachers. <laughs> I had and when you think- coming up and yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. And are, are now, is it mostly teachers in Texas that you work with or are they everywhere and coming to your webinars just online? How, how is that working? Yeah, well, you know, I was invited by a university also in, in Mexico to give um, uh, workshops at kind of virtual nowadays, you know, with, with Zoom. And I thought first, okay, it's going to be targeting Mexican uh, teachers, no? But then it ends up that anybody can uh, subscribe to it. So t- we have teachers that live in the Amazon and um, Argentinian teachers. And so everybody really kind of joined this, this webinar. So I'm, I'm glad that, you know, with technology, we can help expand the the knowledge and the supports for teachers because they are, they don't get, they get very little support now. And so this helps. Well, hopefully. so here's a question for you in the U S it feels like all anyone wants to talk about when it comes to literacy education is science of reading right now. And how many different ways can we put SOR to some, on top of something <laughs> yes. when you, when you're doing a webinar in Mexico or Argentina, is it, are they in the same place? Is, is science of reading their topic or is there something else that they're talking about in literacy yeah. and, and reading education? Yeah, yeah, very good question. Well, you know, I think that what they want is really trying to to be more. Um, I, mean, I mean, a little bit like when we started here, not trying to understand better how to support their kids and how to teach reading in a more efficient way. So we don't talk so much about the science of reading, but more like how to teach explicitly and systematically, and how to really think about okay, can we screen students for uh, to see if they need additional supports and. Uh, uh, how, what are the, the best ways to do that, you know? And so we, we, we do a little bit of assessment, but we also do about training about how to teach explicitly and how to read w- books and, uh, um, 
and things so like a little that. more tactical it sounds like yeah it is exactly because i mean unfortunately what has happened uh, for many many years in latin america and in spain too actually that's why uh, you know i also do research in spain but i'm just saying is that um we had more of a constructivist approach. So the approach of the whole language approach, the approach of, you know, just show kids books and then, you know, they will read and be attracted naturally. And uh, as you know, well, that doesn't work. And so there are teachers in Latin America, I mean, and I think a large number that that want something different, you know, because that uh, system is not working for not working. many of them. Yeah. Okay, let me ask you one more question about your career, and then we'll move to our five rapid fire questions. Okay. When you think about, I mean, really and truly, um, my team and I were going through articles and just some of the different awards that you've won. And when you think about like what you are the most proud of or the contribution that you've had that you think had the biggest impact, what what comes to mind for you with your work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I I think that uh, for me, really, the biggest award is to try to. Um, to support teachers who are particularly in elementary school. So, uh, you know, teaching kids to read in both languages and really um, committed to that so that they, the kids can become bilingual and biliterate. So not just, you know, like for the purpose of learning English, but also for the purpose of maintaining their culture and their identity and their, uh, you know, their assets and really, um, you know, feel proud of that. And I think that uh, that's something that I always, um, well, that I hope at least to achieve, not that people can feel proud that they can do it and that they can still maintain their uh, both their cultures and their identities, even whether it's teachers or students, but at the same time also know what is evidence-based, you know, like what is it that really um, can help kids and uh, really kind of um, distribute that, you know, really make it more um, um, e e equitable you know, for everybody. And I think um, that the science of reading does that, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, it's funny you say that about kids being proud of their language. Uh, I, I, I've been asked a few times, like the, the moment I'm most proud of at Amira, and I have a few different ones, but the one that I, I tell the most was I was in New Jersey at a school and it was right before our, our Spanish product was ready to release. So we, we had English, English was doing really well all over the country and we were getting ready to release Spanish. And on my device, I had like Spanish. I had it like, like we've been testing it with kids and stuff like that. And so this school in New Jersey had just gotten a student who didn't speak a word of English. Every kid, other kid is like headphones on, reading with a mirror in English. And this kid is like, I have no idea. So I pull out my laptop and just like, get, and gave him the span. And you could just see his whole face, like just like his whole life just change of like, okay, I can do this, right? Yeah. Like I can yeah. be just like, I can, they're all doing it. I'm, it might be my language, but I can put on my headphones and play too, to the point where I had to like take my computer back from him. But that moment of just realizing like yeah. that opportunity that, that someone can feel proud of the language they have. And, and just like you said, like there's so much that can, is transferable and that, that they have those strengths and it's valuable. So that moment means a lot to me. So it, it, it means a lot that you're kind of saying the same thing, that if we can get more teachers and more yeah. kids to be able to be in a classroom speaking Spanish and feeling comfortable and confident and like what they have as an asset is a, is a really yeah. special yeah. endeavor. <laughs> Yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it just reminds me, your, your anecdote, it reminds me also one that I had with a program that, that I have on science vocabulary, um, you know, Elva. And so we had one of the kids, they had to repeat uh, the, the tutor, the virtual tutor asked their, um, the kid a question. And he was like, if you can only tell me to me in Spanish, I can answer you. And uh, so we, you know, of course, it was a call like, okay, we need to kind of expand this and also have the program in Spanish. But uh but they are interested and they want to learn. I mean, what, that's what I see always with the kids. Right. And it's just like, we just have to figure out, you know, where they are so that we can really provide them with that support. Give them that need. chance. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, we are running low on time. This has been a really fun conversation and we've covered like a full spectrum of topics really quickly. Yeah. So let me ask you the five questions that we ask every guest. Okay. So the first one um, is pretty simple. So the podcast is called More Than a Test. At Amira, we call it that because uh, we believe that you can know what, how a kid is doing every day as a reader, not just during the assessment. So they're more than a test, but every guest hears more than a test and thinks of something else. When you heard the title more than a test, what did you think of? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that, that's a really good question. Um, well, I, the, I thought that the program was providing more than just a test. It's not like, you know, using it to to see where kids are, whether it's screening or progress monitoring, but it's really also teaching them. Uh, yep, with a the tutor, exactly, yeah. great. Yes, with a tutor. 
Um, we always ask them, every guest, to have a literary moment or a lit moment. So a moment of you in a book that is either something that is like your happy place or changed your life or something like that. So what's your lit moment? Yeah, gosh, yeah. Yeah, when you when I read that, uh, you know, I, it's, it's so many. But uh, but one of the ones that came to mind is really the, the two books by the first two books that Esmeralda Santiago uh, wrote, um, you know, Casi Una Mujer and then... Um, Cuando era Puerto Riqueña, so she comes from Puerto Rico and then moves here and her the whole bilingualism and how she moved from being Spanish only speaker to bilingual speaker and uh, and how to navigate those two worlds, knowing that are in a way so so different, but they're also sometimes very similar. So that those books always inspired me and I, I think about them um, often. When was the first time you read them? Uh, it was it was actually when when I think they must have almost come out like in 1994 1995 so uh, you know it's still it's a while ago but but I, I kind of really you know got that impacted by them yeah yeah there are other writers too that I like to John Palariri does the same thing with India and moving here to Spain but that kind of yes. transition for me maybe because it's my own personal experience too is always it's kind of story. like <laughs> interesting <laughs> for, and uh, I like love to to read about how others experienced it, yeah. yeah. Books are always either mirrors or windows. It sounds like you like your mirrors. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, a piece of technology that you love. Yeah, uh, well, you know, I we are really kind of like now into the speech recognition system uh, and automated scoring and really kind of like think about how we can leverage that to support children to understand better where they're coming from, what are they thinking about when they hear words and... Uh, Particular words connected to science or other content, and uh, uh, I'm fascinated by what we're finding. You know, I mean, we are finding now we're doing a, a study on the cultural influences of student responses, and you know, we find that students um, respond based, for example, on their knowledge of the words in Spanish. You know, like for example, the word inventar, uh, inventor, that yeah. is you know, something somebody that has done something new has never been done before, and but they translate it into inventar. Inventar means to to tell a lie in Spanish. And so we're fascinated by knowing like, oh, wow, this is what the kid is actually thinking when he hears uh, inventor. No? And, uh, and to us, I mean, to me particularly, it's, it's really fascinating to learn more about how, where kids are and how we can help them. And from there to kind of move into, um, you know, understanding better content and, and deeper content in, in any language. So, yeah. Great answer. And that is really fascinating. I, I haven't, I hadn't thought about that before, but it totally makes sense. And I think there's a lot that we at Amira are talking about too. And we get recordings back of kids and we hear them like say something about the, like they're reading, but then all of a sudden they kind of like mention something and you're like, Oh, weird that they were thinking. That's not what I thought they were thinking. Yes. So yes, kids, exactly. yeah. <laughs> all right, the, the best advice you've ever been given. Oh gosh. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Let me see here. Um, Oh, I, I think maybe um, sometimes to let go of things, sometimes, you know, like you're thinking about something and you obsess on it and you keep going with it. And instead of maybe just letting it go, wait a few days and then whether it's responding to an email or who said, what somebody said or, you know, a, a paper that you have to revise. So I think sometimes take a little bit of time to, to reflect on it and then kind of tackle it. And I, uh, that uh, I think it's... Uh, being effective after I learned. <laughs> I think yeah, that's so advice I have to keep hearing. No matter how many times I hear it, like I'm yeah. glad to hear it today. I'll probably need to hear it again tomorrow. And then the last yes. question is one book you think everyone should read. Yeah, you know, so I was thinking, of course, in the I mean, of course the ones that the Admirado Santiago I totally recommend. But uh but I was thinking in terms of reading is I really like the the Mark Seidenberg book, you know, on uh, uh language and yeah, language at the speed of sight. I mean, yes. I think that that book is really like an eye opener for me. And although you know there are so many other books that have come before that that I also think is fascinating, you know, Marshall Proust and all the other ones, Proust and the Squid, and uh, but um, but that one really I think kind of summarizes things nicely and in a way, very kind of uh, comprehensive way. So. Yeah, I think, I think Claude I'm Goldenberg thinking. gave that one to me and I was, it was like a week of like hitting my husband while he was asleep and being like, do you know? And I, like as someone who's like really into reading, I was, I, it was, it was an eye opener for me too. So thanks for mentioning it. Well, thank yeah. you so much for being here. This has been a great conversation. You let me ask some hard questions and we talked about a lot of different things. So it's been really fun and um, we really appreciate it. Thanks for joining us on the More Than a Test podcast. If you found this conversation valuable, subscribe to our YouTube channel and find us on your favorite podcast platform. 
At Amira Learning, we believe every child deserves a chance to become a reader, and we're excited to be part of this conversation. See you next week, and thanks for joining.